In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good, no good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard about it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. Well, here we are. It's almost Christmas. Christmas is uh, one of my favorite times of the year, and um, especially for Levi, my eight-year-old. It's his favorite time. Uh, he has a birthday that's on December 19th, so Christmas is kind of all bundled together for him. So in his room, his Christmas tree doesn't come down until March, and it goes up in August, and that's just how it works in our house. I found him this year in August sitting by the fireplace with a cup of hot chocolate watching a Santa Claus movie. He tried to turn the fireplace on, but thankfully I had disconnected the gas line for the summer, uh, so that didn't work out. Uh, given that it was 90 degrees, it was probably a good thing. But we do this, don't we? We like to sentimentalize Christmas with hot chocolate and snow and, and beautifully wrapped presents. And we get together with family, and we picture these family gatherings. They're far more picturesque than we like to think, aren't they? It's a time when the entire world looks to the story, the Christmas story, the story of Jesus. Now, this story now shares the stage with Santa Claus and Rudolph and Frosty. But no doubt, the story is rooted in Jesus. That's not really a profound thought, is it, to say that Christmas is about Jesus? But it is about Jesus, no doubt. This evening we've read the story, we've heard the story as Anna read it. It's a familiar story, but allow me to challenge you this evening to come to this story as if you've never heard it before. Now, that's kind of hard to do, isn't it? Because we've been singing about the story and we have heard the story over and over again. That's hard. But as you come to the story this evening, let me invite you to come to it in a fresh way. And we will find ourselves not focused on the presents that we get for Christmas, but rather the table that is before us this morning, because that is really the centerpiece of the story. Our story this evening is from Luke's Gospel. And let's just talk about Luke for a minute because he's the one writing this Gospel. Who is this guy writing the Gospel? We know that he was a companion of Paul's, and we also know that he traveled to Jerusalem 
for about two years while Paul was in prison. He remained in Palestine in this area where Jesus lived and walked. And we know that he wrote the Gospel of Luke, which is a story of Jesus. But we also know that he wrote the book of Acts, which is the story of the early church. And most scholars believe that Luke, during this two-year period in Jerusalem, did a lot of research for the gospel that he wrote. And some even believe that he would have spent time with Mary. And even as he spent time with her, chapters 1 and 2 of Luke are really a reflection from Mary's thoughts. So Luke is a physician, he is a historian, and he is writing this gospel. And we picture him kind of sitting with Mary as she tells the story of what happened. Today we're going to look at this story, the birth of Jesus... As Linus said, this is what Christmas is all about, Charlie Brown. All right, this is the part of the story. But, but I want you to shed your sentimental Christmas stories this morning. You see, throughout the years, people have embellished the story, haven't they? They've written children's books, and they've talked about this shepherd or this donkey. And in many ways, we, this, the story has kind of grown. But the story itself is very brief in the Gospel of Luke. Let me invite you this, morning, this evening to join me on a journey as we find a teenage couple surprised by the movement of God. Their story is told. And the part of Christmas that we call the story, it's really only 20 verses. Do you realize that? 20 verses in Luke's gospel. And the story of the nativity is only 7 verses in Luke's gospel. A mere paragraph. Do you realize Luke's gospel has over a thousand verses in it? And the story is only 20 verses that we're reading this morning. All that some people know of Jesus is just a fragment, isn't it, of the story, of the, of the entire story. So let's look at these 20 verses this evening. We read in verse 1, in those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So the story begins with Caesar. He's got a plan. His plan is to tax the world, the known world of his day. But God has another plan, doesn't he? We keep reading in verse 4. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, to the town of David, because he belonged to to the house and the line of David. So Joseph travels to Bethlehem. There are all sorts of debates on how this worked out and why he had to go to Bethlehem. But the short of it is that he probably had some property in the area. And so he goes there to be taxed for tax purposes. Luke Luke wants us to see also that Joseph is from the line of David. That's important. His ancestry is from David, from Judea. And so that's where he goes. So Joseph does what he's supposed to do. Now look at the next verse. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. Now the word here, pledged to be married, is the word engaged. And so Mary and Joseph are not officially married yet, but they're engaged. And and in ancient times, this was a big deal because if you broke the engagement, it was the equivalent to a divorce. So it's a very serious commitment that they've made to each other. But here's the strange thing. They're engaged. They've not yet consummated the marriage, but she is expecting a child. That just doesn't equate, does it? Why would she be pregnant if they're not married? Well, we know from chapter 1 that Mary's baby was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Mary is pregnant, and you would think that a pregnant woman would not make such a long journey, but she does. And simply put, Luke tells us in verse 6, While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. The time came when they were in Bethlehem. They were at just the right place, and at just the right time, the baby is born. And look at how the birth is described. She wraps him in strips of cloth. This is what you do with young children. You help them feel secure. You wrap them up tightly. And this will also help the shepherds recognize him. We'll see that later on. But where does she put him? She puts him in a manger. Now, we've heard the story so many times, haven't we? Yeah, yeah, Jesus in a manger. It just kind of flies by, doesn't it? But, but let the weight of that fall on you for a minute. God enters our world, and he comes and is placed in a manger. 
in an animal feeding trough. The, the creator of the universe coming to our world placed in the dirty and the messy. Now, there are a couple of messages here. First of all, we're reminded that when Jesus comes into the world, he comes to the lowly, doesn't he? Even in his birth, even as a baby, he's not about comfort and pleasure. He's about discomfort and humility. The second message here is that Jesus is rejected from the very beginning. Do you see that in the text? Even as a baby, there is no room for him in the end. She placed him in a manger, verse 7, because there was no room for him them in the end. Now, we, we think of the Holiday Inn Express, right, with a no vacancy sign out there. But mo most likely, it's a private house, but they're all filled because of the census. There's no room for Mary, no room for the baby. The normal comforts that you would expect for a new mother and a new baby, there are none for Mary and Jesus. Again, Jesus is coming in humility, he's placed in a manger. He comes in rejection. He shows up in an uncomfortable way. Where, where do we get the idea that Jesus came to make us comfortable? Because Jesus did not come to the comfortable. Where do we get the idea that God came so that we can feel good? You, you see, when Jesus comes, he comes, and these are two key words, he's placed in a manger. And there is no room. I guess that's three words, right? We come to this next part. Let me point out. Luke spends twice as much space on this next part of the story. And we, we often see it as a nice addition, don't we? The shepherds and the angels. But Luke spends twice as much, much on that part of the story. He says, spends seven verses on this first part, seeing kind of the, the scene from an earthly point of view, but he spends 13 verses on this part about the shepherds and the angel. I think that's a, there's a message in there for us. Maybe we need to think about Christmas, not just from an earthly perspective, but also from a heavenly perspective. Can't you imagine Luke sitting with Mary in her old age? She's remembering what happened. She tells him about the facts. There was a census and taxation, and we made this trip to Bethlehem. The baby was born, and I placed him in a manger because there wasn't any room for us in the end. But, but then, Luke, hold on to your hats. This is going to blow you away, this next part of the story. In verse 8, there were shepherds living in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Nearby, we got this group of people. They're watching sheep. And, and what you need to understand is that shepherds in this day and time were considered the lowest of all occupations. Many people considered them thieves, kind of the low life of the day. And, and these guys are just doing their job. They're just out in the field. And, and God comes to them. He includes them in the story. Once again, God includes the unlikely. This group of body odor infested men surprised by God look at verse 9 an angel of the lord appeared to them and the glory of the lord shone around them and they were terrified an angel maybe gabriel maybe the same angel that showed up to mary and zachariah in chapter 1 appears to them and it's almost as if he comes out of nowhere and when he does it says the bible says god's glory is all over you can imagine they would be afraid when they saw him. They're just hanging out in the field, and this angel shows up, lights up the sky. It's like something from a sci-fi movie. These guys are terrified. Now, notice, Christmas so far is not warm. It's not touchy. It's not feely. We've got a pregnant teen on a long trip giving birth in a place where animals live. The baby's bed is a manger. And now we've got this smelly group of lowlifes, the ones that God chooses to tell first about the thing. They're about to pee in their pants when the angel shows up. No hot chocolate, no warm fires, no beautiful trees, no snowfall. But it gets better. Verse 10, But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I'll bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Don't fear is what they say. I have not come to take you out. I've come to bring you good news. Uangelizo, the gospel. That's the word for the gospel there. I've come to bring you the gospel. And it will be great joy for all people. Verse 11. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying 
in a manger. When's it going to happen? Today. This very day, a Savior, he says. Now, this word Savior was a common word in the day. It often referred to political leaders like like Caesar or like governors or kings. They would say that, that that person is a Savior. But Luke is saying Caesar is not Savior. Other kings are not Savior. The mystery gods of the day are not Savior. Jesus, this baby lying in a manger, is Savior. Jesus will be referred to as Savior over and over again throughout his ministry. You see, his coming is salvation. He is your Savior, they tell the, he tells the shepherds. He is Christos Kurios, Christ the Lord. Luke is saying that this baby is the Messiah. He's the promised one. The one who's predicted in the Old Testament. He's here. When's he here? He's here today, they tell him. And if you want to find him, there is a sign. A simeon, he says. Now this word is often used along with miracles. It means something different. Something out of the ordinary. And Luke Luke says, the angel says, there will be a sign for you. Here's the sign. A baby wrapped in cloths lying in a manger. Now back up with me for a minute here. Okay, the Savior, the Messiah, okay, we're up for that. Let's go meet him. He'll probably be riding a big horse. He'll probably have lots of muscles. Tell us what the sign is. Which castle? What's the code so we can let the guards know so we can get in? A a baby? What? In a manger? An animal feeding trough? Then before the words could sink in, verse 13 says, Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. Just in case the one angel didn't get their attention. Now the whole sky is full of angels. God wants them to know something incredible is happening here. He wants them to know that he's up to something big. And and what do the angels say? Notice they're not singing. They're speaking. They're proclaiming. They're, they're, They're saying that this whole deal is about God's glory. And this whole deal is about peace on the earth. Verse 15, when the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Are you in? Yeah, I'm in. Let's go. Let's do it. Let's go see what's going on. These guys are simply blown away by what's happened to them, so they go. And notice how they go here in verse 16. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in a manger. Now, they're probably picking up pace here, aren't they? They're they're even jogging as they go. They're hurrying to find this sign. And then they find Mary and Joseph and the baby. There he is. Can you believe it? Just like the angel said. Verse 17, when they had seen him, They spread the word concerning what had been told about about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. You know, as Luke was going around this area gathering information for his gospel, I wonder if he talked to someone who spoke to one of the shepherds. Maybe he did. And they were telling him the story. They were telling him about how the shepherds were going around telling everybody about what happened to the about. What happened to them? God was up to something big that night, and it's not like we would have expected. Isn't that how God tends to work too often? He does things in ways that we don't expect Him to do it. It'd be 30 more years before this baby would grow into the man, and the message of the angels would be fulfilled. But here, On that Bethlehem night, God was moving. God was working. He was stepping into our time, into our world. And he used the most unlikely cast of characters, didn't he? Teenagers and shepherds. Verse 19, But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen which were just as they had been told. Can you see Mary, maybe in her old age, telling Luke this story? I didn't understand it all, but God was doing something. And there we were in that place. It smelled like urine and feces. And the baby was lying in a manger. And then these smelly guys come in telling us, 
that angels had shown up to them. But God was there. And God was moving. And God was doing something incredible that night. You know, this scene could easily be glossed over. This scene has become so familiar to us that we often fail to really understand the ramifications of this story. Why did Jesus come as a baby? Why didn't he just come as a full-grown man? You see, God chose to step into our time in the most vulnerable way possible. That's why he came as a baby. And he came in humility in the lowest place possible. Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, who, he says, who, being in very nature God, speaking of Jesus, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. You see, that's the message of Christmas. God came to us all the way down to us. Maybe this evening, you know, you're in church because your family brought you here. But maybe when it comes to God, you're, you're thinking, you know, I'm just not good enough for God. He's too good for me. Maybe you feel you don't deserve God. But, but that's the message of Christmas. That Jesus came all the way down to where you are. You can't be too low. This is what Christmas teaches us about God. What does this story mean for us today? Look at the characters in the story. They're smelly, they're dirty, they're lowly. You see, Jesus didn't come to the rich. He didn't come to the clean. He came to the lowly. He came to the dirty. And Jesus makes a statement about who he is in his birth. Jesus communicates his mission through his birth. And Mary's putting it all together. And Luke is putting it all together. I'm sure that we have lost this message of Christmas. We, we've turned the manger scene into a clean, picturesque scene. We put purple robes and clean-cut beards on the shepherds. We sprinkled icicles and snow all over the stable. But that's not what Christmas is all about. You see, Christmas is as much about this table as anything else. It's about the baby Jesus who was placed in a manger growing to be a man and then giving himself on a dirty cross for you and me. He takes on the price of our sins. That's what the baby Jesus does. So what an appropriate way to begin Christmas. Gathered with our church family in this place. In this sacred place at this sacred table. And this evening as we come and as we celebrate Christmas. You know children you're probably thinking about those gifts, those gifts that you'll get in the morning. And maybe you adults are too. But maybe tonight we need to stop and think about what Jesus has done for us. The greatest gift of all. It can't be wrapped in a present with a bow on top. It's too dirty for that. He gave himself for us on a cross. He endured the scorn for our shame. And so as we gather this evening, we celebrate Christmas his body broken for us. His blood shed for us. We're going to pause for a minute as Matt and Heather come now and sing. And then we're going to invite you to the table.